States on Hunter, and I've run that race and won it seven times in a row. It's a race that takes place in Squaw Valley, California, over the Sierra Nevada mountain ranges, down into the American River canyons. Temperatures can reach over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is the best part of that race. You, you literally look forward to 80 miles. I'm going to move around this way, so, oops, so you can everybody see you that's over here. You get to uh, go through the American River, and even though that water is as cold as can be, melt basically from snow melt in the mountains, this is what you look forward to. Um, this is the first time I saw daylight. Most people finish this race in the dark, or they see daylight the next day. Um, I ran and set a new course record back in 2004 and ran 15 hours, 36 minutes. So to give you an idea, that's 9 minute, 22 second pace. 18,000 feet of climbing, 23,000 feet of descent. So not a flat, flat London high park run by any stretch. Most people, to give you an idea, um, as I mentioned, will be out there for 24 more hours. In fact, the limit is 30 hours. So in my book, um, people are out there twice as long as me, and they deserve just as much credit. Uh, in 2010, I ran the 24-hour World Championships. Now, Running around a circle that's one mile in length did never seem to be something I was interested in, but the mental components of running these races, you literally, um, I, I think it's probably not a harder thing that I've done in my life. Basically doing the same route for 24 hours, seeing how many miles they can rack up. And that's the whole premise beside, behind a 24-hour race. I set a new American record at that time, which has been since broken, 165.7 miles. So, uh, for those of you who are familiar with 8-minute eight, eight uh, 40 pace, that's essentially doing that six and a half marathons back to back to back to back. Um, that's including bathroom breaks too. Uh, running that over the course of uh, 24 hours in one day. Another race, who's read Born to Run, by the way, at this audience? Okay, many of you. Uh, Chris McDougall talks about the Badwater Ultra Marathon. It's a race I told myself
cooler of beer. And I said, hey, I might want that later. He's like, where am I going to put my beer later in the race? Um, meanwhile, I'm putting my, uh, my dirty butt into that uh, cooler and sinking and submerging my core into it to keep my body cool. And this is the best two minutes that you can spend in Death Valley. Especially when it's 125 degrees out. Um, so not only are you crossing Death Valley in 120 plus degree temperatures, the, the next day when you start to make your approach to my pictures I'm putting up due to the light here, but you can see that's the road that you go up. Um, it's the most daunting finish I've ever encountered in an ultra marathon. Um, I've already gone 123 miles, and the last 13 miles are basically an uphill climb. So when you see that and you're thinking, gosh, that's the last 13 miles, um, it's very demoralizing. But the reason these races are designed this way is to really not only test the physical body, but the mental and the psychological. Some of you who've read Born to Run, um, and he'd run, probably have heard of Dusty. This is what he looks like. He is that wild and crazy. <laughs> He's paced me in a lot of my events, and uh, been a huge inspiration to me to get running. Um, going from somebody who used to hate running and hate vegetables, and now I run all marathons, and now I'm eating. So go figure. It's hope for you, trust me. Uh, finally, a race that's been a big uh, part of in terms of, like, people ask me all the time, what is my most favorite race? What do I think is the most beautiful? Uh, it has to rank up there as the Hard Rock 100 Mile. It's a race that takes place in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado, 100 miles with 33,000 feet of climbing. So if you can imagine climbing to Mount Everest, that's essentially what you're doing over the course of 100 miles. Um, the air is so thin, you cross six passes over 13,000 feet, you literally feel like you're breathing through a cocktail straw the whole time. And in 2007, when I was down there a month before the race, three days before the race, I decided to play soccer with a bunch of uh, football, with a bunch of six and seven year olds, as part of the YMCA Dare program, and I badly sprained my ankle, so Hard Rock 100, but it wasn't hard enough already, um, I did that on a sprained ankle with an air cast on the whole time. These are some of the views that you get up. Uh, this is going up uh, Andy's Peak, which is a 14,000 foot peak that you climb at 42 miles into the race. Um, a lot of times there will be plenty of snow. In fact, they have fixed roads. So you're literally sailing down the snow, flying your way up any way you can. And uh, again, gives you an idea. Of course, that's what your face looks like at 14,000 feet, 40 miles into the race. Everybody thinks it's real easy for us top guys and gals. Um, we hurt just as much as you, even if you've never run an ultra marathon. Um, it's not easy for us, trust me. Nine mile descents where you're dropping down into these uh, canyons and valleys. This is Grand Swamp Pass at mile 90 into the race. You have to claw yourself up the scree field. Every step you take forward, you take half a step back because the scree is spinning. People use trekking poles to get up it, but you literally come from way down in that canyon and that valley down below nine miles. So the, the climbs, uh, I was just up in the Lake District yesterday. The mountains look very similar at the top, but um, unfortunately you don't get nine mile climbs on this. So imagine doing a lot of the climbs in the lakes three times that way. Um, and here's what the ankle looked like. And it's a good segue into what I'm going to be talking about because a lot of athletes don't think about nutrition because, of course, you know, we don't notice until we get injured or until we have problems with our diet and our health when we start paying attention to it. So, I did not use any ibuprofen when I ran that hard rock one time. Um, zero ibuprofen or pharmaceutical drugs beforehand. The things that I did were all natural, so everything from ginger to arnica montana, um, turmeric, I was basically blending up turmeric and soy milk. Trust me, it's, it's way better than it sounds. I was learning this from an Indian uh, professor that I was studying up in the mountains that I uh, was cooking with. Um, essential fatty acids, vitamin C, these are all foods and readily available uh, in pharmacies as well as natural food stores or grocery store that are very powerful anti-inflammatories. Unfortunately, they don't kick in within hours or an hour like um, ibuprofen, but the effects are much greater or longer. That's been my whole goal with running and how I really paid attention to nutrition in my career is that I wasn't looking for the quick fix. I was in it for the long run, the long haul. So those of you who are just starting to think about your diet and sports nutrition, 
nutrition and how you feel your body. Um, don't think about the quick fixes. Think about long term. Long term health to me is way more important than winning races. And that's why I changed my diet. So um, I think this quote kind of sums it up: is let food be thy medicine. It's by Hippocrates. Um, not the other way around. You know, medicine be thy food, which uh, of course these days everybody uh, pops a pill for anything they can take. Um, maybe not here in the UK, but in the US. Uh, pharmaceutical drugs. In fact, we have it up constantly bombarding our television and commercials. Um, people ask for the drugs before their physicians even prescribe them. So I think we need to start looking to food being the medicine. Um, who's heard of Kyle Skaggs? The Skaggs brothers, the born behind me, some of you. Um, I get questions all the time. What's Kyle up to after he set the record in the Hard Rock 100? He no longer runs ultra marathons. He's actually an organic farmer. So uh, when you retire from ultra running, um, maybe there's a career in farming for you. That's what Kyle, Kyle is doing right now. So I'm glad to point that out. Um, one last race before I get into uh, some formulas and things that you guys can put into practice with your own training and nutrition is the Spartathlon. It's a race that takes place from Athens, Greece, to Sparta, and it commemorates the route that the Dipides ran, basically trying to get a message from Athens to Sparta to get the Spartans to help out the Athenians who were being bombarded by the Persians. So there's a lot of history and tradition, even though uh, the Greek people aren't known to be great runners, uh, the Olympic spirit in this race is amazing. People just come out in droves and in villages, you have children following you, you run through ancient sites, as there's an ancient Corinth, ancient Emea. Uh, even though it's 152 miles of pavement, um, it definitely ranks up there for me anyways. It's one of the most memorable experiences of my life. Um, a lot of people ask me the most marathons, well, how close are these races? And uh, you can literally be neck and neck. This is me and Belmir Nunez racing about 90 miles into this part of the So um, you look at the results, and everybody's spread out at the end. But during the race, it can be neck and neck and going head to head. Um, here's a shot of uh, some children trailing me. Um, they ride their bikes, um, hollering out to motivate anyone. It's, it's really a magical experience. And of course, the whole town of Sparta comes out and celebrates. They put the olive wreath on you. They drink uh, river water from the uh, Herodotus River. So there's just a lot of tradition and history with this event. Okay. The big question um, is hydration. Hydration is really big. Um, some of you may be familiar, there's a lot of debate right now with nutrition and hydration. And uh, anybody familiar with Dr. Tim Noakes? He's a South African physician, uh, one of my heroes because he's an out of the box thinker. Um, he's really thinking that we're over hydrating. And uh, his whole thing is that people should be drinking fluids based on taste or based on first. And I do agree with him on that point. Um, today I'm going to talk about some formulas that he might actually kind of disagree with. He might say, don't even worry about the formulas. But a lot of you who are new runners, new exercisers, um, starting new exercise programs, it's really hard to know because a lot of us just don't pay attention to our body or don't know how our thirst mechanism works. So what I'd like to do today is give you a, a couple ideas of how you can find out better until your thirst calibrator and uh, monitor in your own body monitors them. So uh, I just wanted to point that out because a lot of people are like, Scott, why are you uh, telling us how much to drink? Um, I think it's good to have a range. So one thing I've learned is experiment. So the biggest thing you can do, uh, because fluid and hydration intake is really dependent upon a lot of factors. Um, humidity, temperature, uh, altitude. I live at in Colorado now where the temp average elevation typically is 5 much different than if you're down here in London at sea level and soaking in a lot of humidity. So whatever you do, make sure you're taking into account those factors. The biggest one, though, is your own body weight. So please don't drink as much as your training partner. If you're 120 pounds and your training partner is 180 pounds, um, don't drink the same amount. And this is probably what Dr. Tim Noakes would say, too, is a lot of people think they should just drink and drink and drink, and that's why you see marathoners healing over or having problems with hyponatremia, too much fluids. So the best thing you can do to figure this out is experimentation and do a sweat test. So you can Google sweat test um, and get the exact protocol. But basically,
weights, taking your body weight, naked body weight, before you run and then after you run. Now, when you finish the run, make sure you towel up because a lot of sweat can still be on your body. Um, if you have real long hair, make sure you bring your hair out as much as possible because what you're trying to do is you take your naked body weight before the run, then take your naked body weight after to try to figure out how much fluid loss you have during the run. Now, um, if you urinate or uh, go number two while you're out on the run, um, ideally you should measure that as well. I know it sounds a little weird, but uh, that's why you may not go out for a three-hour run uh, and do this test. You might go out for an hour, hour and a half. Hopefully you're not vomiting um, and losing fluids that way. But basically you want to account for only the fluids you've lost through sweat. So you have the difference and you have the weight. Um, who knows their, uh, their conversion of uh, basically pounds to pints? Good. You all, you're all coming on the metric system. This is what's interesting. Um, you guys invented the system. We still use it in the U.S. Um, and basically a pint is a pound. So you can easily calculate that out. You can also use the metric system. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's right. Your pints are a different size than ours. You, you measure them by uh, here and that. Basically the pub pints, right? I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, you guys use 20. So, Basically, um, use your conversion to figure out pounds or body weight, if you're using kilograms, to how much fluid that would be, okay? Then you can calculate that, and that will tell you how much water you should take in to balance out the body. But if you notice here, I put 1 to 2 percent, that's a minus 1 to 2 percent body fuel, and your body weight, this is why if you notice, you can go out for a run and not drink a sip. Some of you have maybe run marathons, um, drinking very little. The reason for that is, if it isn't too hot and you drink some on the run, you might be 1 to 2% dehydrated and you're probably going to be fine. Once you start getting into 3%, the heart rate goes up because you don't have enough blood volume. So, I use the 1 to 2% of your body weight. You can be 1 to 2% body weight down. So, for some of you, you can be 1 to 2, 3 pounds, 4 pounds down, depending upon your body weight. That's why it's very important to use your own body weight. And you'll be perfectly fine. And this is why you'll see the East African runners, the top Caucasian runners, sometimes they don't drink at all during a marathon. And it's very important that you, uh, you take that into consideration. So as I think goes with Dr. Tim Noakes, the body can actually function in a little bit of hydrate, dehydration. You just can't go beyond 3%. Anybody been 5% dehydrated? 4 or 5%? Okay, if you have been, you start feeling super nauseated. In fact, some races in the U.S. ultras, they'll pull you at that 5% or make you sit down and drink and make sure you get through it. So, if you've ever had feelings of heat stroke, uh, heat illness, and that nausea, um, you start becoming lightheaded, that's pretty serious. So that's why you want to stay away from the danger zone, which starts getting into that 3 to 5%. You want to be very careful. At 7%, you need to be rushed to an emergency room. So, hydration is a very important topic. There's a lot of debate, like I said. The best way is to start experimenting, start figuring out your own factors and your own, basically, environment that you're working on. Does that make sense to people? Get out there and play with it, okay? Don't just read a book, take some numbers down. You've got to start playing with this. Okay. Sodium. Anybody supplement sodium in their marathons? Probably half marathons, shorter, or other endurance, maybe your half Ironman events, um, cycling events. Um, I supplement with sodium because I'm out there for 16, 24 hours. Um, electrolytes become more important. So those of you who have cramping issues, you may want to try supplementing a little sodium. And this is if you're not getting enough sodium in your exercise, recovery drinks, or if you're not getting enough in your foods typically. So I use capsules that are typically 200 to 400 milligrams of sodium. And for my body weight, I'm 165, 170 pounds. I'm doing in the neighborhood of 300 to 400 gram milligrams of sodium per hour. So start playing with this. If you're having issues where you notice you're cramping, notice that you're really salty after uh, your runs or your workouts, you might try supplementing with sodium. Um, there are some people say, if you're eating enough salt in your daily diet, you may not need to worry about this. But a lot of people cut their salt intake way down due to health reasons, and you might want to bump it up a little bit when you're exercising. Okay, let's talk about nutrition. And I've got a question for all of you. Um, how many, how many of you?
you, oh, let's, let's do this, let's see if anybody in the audience, who can tell me what your body burns for fuel? Fat, protein, carbohydrate, while you're endurance exercising. So when you're in, using endurance, what fuel are you using of those three? I heard of fat, any carbohydrates, David? carbs, any protein, folks? Come on, we gotta have some paleo folks in the audience, right? Okay, the answer to that is ideally mostly fat, okay? This person who said carbohydrate wasn't too far off um, because there are times where you're burning. But as far as the fuel that you have stored in your muscles, stored in your bloodstream, and when you're typically doing endurance exercise, it should be fat. A smaller percentage might be coming from carbohydrate to keep your brain working, to make sure that you're not bonking, but in general it should be fat. Um, those of you who said protein, um, ideally it should be burning protein. If you're burning protein, what that means is you might actually be going into ketosis. And uh, in ultra marathons, you might see that, or extended events like an Ironman triathlon. When you're burning protein, you're, you're basically cannibalizing your muscle tissue. You want to stay away from that, okay? It's not a good or efficient fuel. Your most efficient fuel is going to be fat and carbohydrate. So, um, this is a mistake I made, as you've read these run. I thought, okay, when I was first learning how to run and I was experimenting, I thought, well, if I need fat while I'm endurance exercising, why don't I take a flask of olive oil out on my runs? And uh, it's a great you know, fat. I read about it all the time. Olive oil is great. Health benefits are huge. I started carrying a little flask of olive oil and started taking that. Bad idea. Um, basically, it was vomiting. Um, my stomach became super upset. The reason is you don't need to take in fat while you're aerobically exercising. You have plenty of it on your body, you have plenty in your muscle tissue. So uh, the main source of fuel you actually need to eat and enter through your mouth is carbohydrate. Um, now I know there's some of you who may have taken in protein. Uh, there was a lot of debate about it several years ago that you should take in protein. Protein will become important in the next few slides when we talk about recovery. But during exercise, your fat and protein intake should only be equal if you feel like you want to break up the carbohydrate you know, monotony. And so when I'm doing ultras, I'll eat a little fat and protein, but I'm not actually going to be able to benefit. So that's why when I got that upset stomach when I took the olive oil, is unless it's coconut oil, which has medium chain triglycerides, I don't want to get too complicated here, but those of you who read a little bit about MCTs, those you can actually metabolize and burn on the spot. Uh, but for the most part, it's a more advanced thing. I recommend people stay away from high fat foods while exercising. Stay away from the high protein fuel while you're exercising. Focus on carbs, okay? Carbs, who's, who's taking a shot of Coca-Cola or uh, Cola, Mountain Dew, whatever you, you like to do during an event or a training run? What happens when you're bonking and you hit that Coca-Cola? Start feeling better, right? Okay? Because your body, most specifically your nervous system, needs carbohydrate to function. And that's why you get delirious when you bonk, you start seeing scars. So most importantly, it's, it's important for firing on the brain and making sure you stay alert, but also for your muscles because the nerves are firing the muscles. So there's some interesting research where they've had people just switch carbohydrate um, solution or electrolyte drinks in their mouths and not even digest it because they just get enough through their taste buds and it fires the nerves and actually has the same effect as drinking it. So I think we're kind of still learning what carbohydrate is actually doing, but in general, you should be taking it in so that your brain and your nervous system function so you can fire muscles better. Of course, how much should you be eating is the main question. And you can write down this formula. It's applicable for any aerobic exercise longer than 90 minutes. So no matter what you do, cycling, swimming, running, um, mountaineering, skiing, you name it, there's a high and a low. So at the top of the screen here is the low number, and the, the next level down in red is the high number. And when you do this formula, for instance, I've got an example up here. Somebody who's 130 pounds and somebody who's 180 pounds. You'll notice that it's 41 for the smaller weight individual and 57 for the larger. Why do you suppose the larger individual should take in more carbohydrate? Bigger brains? <laughs> Partly right, if you, if you agree with that, but basically more muscle tissue. The larger individual is going to need to eat more to get those muscles firing. So 
This is why don't eat or drink as much as your training partner, unless they're the same body weight. Okay? It's really dependent upon body weight. That's why body weight is calculated in this formula. So, how do we know how many grams? And the reason I work off of grams and calories is because it's much more specific to carbohydrate. You look at your typical label, and I'm sorry if it's not a UK label. I should have pulled it up. It probably is a little different. But in general, it'll say the total carbohydrate grams. Don't worry whether it's sugars or whether it comes from other forms. But you want to look for the total carbohydrate. That's how you figure out how many grams are in your foods. Okay? Who likes to use bananas, potatoes, sweet potatoes on the run? Okay. I'm a big fan of it too. I use the, the gels, the blocks, um, the cliff bars. But you also can use real foods. Just Google or find on a nutrition program how many grams of carbohydrate are in those foods. And you can do the same thing. I use an example here. One banana has about 25 grams of carbohydrate. Um, you know, one gel, a typical gel, um, UK, you might get some of those other uh, gels that are a little different size too, but in the US it's typically about 25 grams. So, for a lot of you, um, it means more than just one gel every hour and a half, okay? A lot of people are typically under carbohydrate consuming while they're out exercising. It makes a huge difference. When I started changing this format, I used to go on my runs after 20 miles and come back, you know, just on the verge of walking, um, and it makes a huge difference in events. You want to be starting this. So, is that making sense to folks? The formula? Okay. I know you had to pull out your calculator and clumps a little bit, but uh, it's it's really somewhat mathematical and scientific. It's not hard science, it's not complicated, but you do have to plug in a few numbers. So for my long runs and races, um, the key thing is practice. Don't go and do something, and some of you have a race tomorrow, I don't run, some of you are running half marathons, running the ultra. Don't go out and do something for the first time on racing. Try it in training, so practice it. Um, the other thing too is when you're consuming 50 grams, 40 grams, 60 grams of carbohydrate product, don't eat that on the top of the hour. I think some people assume, oh, Scott said to eat 50 grams per hour. I'll just eat two gels in, in one shot. What you do want to do is, I use the analogy to my knee drip. You want to have that carbohydrate coming in steadily. So every 20 to 30 minutes is key. Think of it coming in steadily versus don't wait until you're bonking two hours into your run or your event and then think you're going to make up for it. It's very hard to do that. Um, I mentioned earlier some of you use you know, regular solid food, bananas, potatoes, whatever. Um, sports foods versus solid food don't really matter that much except when it comes to digestion. Uh, the sport foods are designed to be digested easier. Um, it's also hard, I love to do bean and rice burritos, but at about 70 and 100 miler, uh, if you ever tried to eat a bean burrito, it's pretty tough to do. So what I like to do is eat my solid food mixed in with sports foods early into the race, and then switch over to the, the basically sport food entirely. And then I'll get into just a real quick, this is more advanced, but if you've ever had a sports drink that's been mixed stronger by accident, ever hit an aid station where you're like, wow, the sports drink is super concentrated, ideally that solution should be 7 to 8%. That's what empties the stomach. So if you've ever had that sloshy gut type feeling where the fluid isn't moving, chances are you might have eaten too much and not drinking enough water, or the solution of your carbohydrate drink, electrolyte drink, is too strong. So the way to calculate that is you take the carbs and grams divided by the milliliters of water. That'll give you your percentage. If it's 9, 10%, you might try backing down and drink more water um, or mix your carbohydrate and drink a little less strong. Lastly, I'll just make a comment on this. Um, who here is familiar with glycemic index? Okay. If you play with it and you're, uh, you ever try like high glycemic, this is like Coca-Cola. Um, you know, it works so well when you're bonking because it's really high glycemic. Um, foods such as, you know, maltodextrin, which aren't a lot of your gels and drinks, they're very low glycemic. That's why they kind of evenly give you a little bit of a, a boost. So you're not going to notice that really quick spike. So basically with glycemic index, you might try playing with that at different stages of, say, training or racing. You might find on a big board uphill, use high glycemic foods if you want that extra kick. Use the low glycemic on a more consistent basis. So it's a little bit more advanced concept.
stuff that I mentioned it because people do get results with it. And then of course, a mountain frequency, I'm going to drill it home again. Every 20 to 30 minutes, try not to do it on the top of the hour. It's really key to keep that frequency coming in. Okay, I have a few more slides. Um, talking a, a little bit about protein and fat because some of you who, who do long ultra distance stuff, your Ironman, your ultra marathons, ultra endurance events, this is where I like to do the protein and the fat just to break up what's going through my stomach because when you're eating constantly for 24 hours, it's nice to have a little mixture. So I like to mix in a, a fermented soy protein drink with rice milk um, to get a little protein. And I do that every two to three hours versus every 20 to 30 minutes. So you might play around with some protein drinks. Uh, fat typically will be in some foods, so I don't specifically add certain fat to things. Um, those here into coconut oil or play around with MCTs, medium chain triglycerides, you can do that as well. Um, just keep it in the low range. No more than three to five grams in a two to three hour period. Keep it really low. It's not a lot of fat. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to talk lastly here about recovery, and I might have a few minutes then for questions, but this is where not only carbohydrate, but protein is important. Does any and protein post-workout. Why is it so important? Anybody in the back? Back on down? Yes. Muscle repair. Very true. You need protein to repair the muscle. I'm looking for something else. So that's that's partially right because you do need it for muscle repair. Repairing the damaged muscle, yes. Glycogen? Did you say glycogen? Basically what you want to do is glycogen is stored in your muscles and ideally when you do a hard workout, anybody who's felt the next day they just kind of feel sluggish, well if you haven't done enough carbohydrate and protein after your workout and the timing is really critical, 20 to 30 minutes, you don't have that glycogen. And glycogen is basically stored carbohydrate that you don't need to eat. It's in your muscles. Most of us have about 60 to 90 minutes worth of that. That's why your top marathoners, the guys and gals that are running just over two hours, they can literally run a race without eating because they're like covering, they're burning a lot of fat for fuel, but then they also have enough glycogen stored in their muscles. Um, they're beast when it comes to this. They have 90 minutes or more. And so they can literally just use that glycogen that is stored. Now, most of us mere mortals have to eat because we burn up through that glycogen. And when we burn through it, we gotta replace it. So that's why after a workout, whether you do hard strength workouts, whether you do tempo, lactate threshold workouts, or you run longer than an hour and a half, two hours, this is when you should be using this formula. So it's long workouts or really intense workouts. So power and strength. The goal here is it's not just a quick um, energy drink, by the way. It's actually, I like to call it like a mini meal or a snack. It's basically a glycogen protein replenisher. So I give an example here. A 130 pound individual would need to take in about 89 grams of carbohydrate. Um, so that's not just a banana. That's like a banana, an energy bar. I use an example here of some different foods that you can use. And some sports drink. It's always a good idea to get some water and hydrate at the same time. So those of you who are just doing a sports drink after your long or really intense workouts, Try to blend in some protein powder, um, something that's high in protein, like a, an energy bar that has about 15 grams or more protein. And then, of course, uh, put some fluids with it as well. Is this making sense to folks? It makes a huge difference. You won't believe the next day how you feel if you're replenishing properly. Okay, lastly, I'm going to, I know some of these books may or may not be published in the UK, but uh, I think most of them are. You can check the, uh, the bookstore upstairs. But everybody asks about um, sports nutrition books and vegetarian sports nutrition books. If you notice, I didn't talk a lot about plant-based um, sports nutrition. The reason for that is you never are really eating a steak while you're running or doing aerobic exercise. We have any steak eaters who like to chow down on a steak while they're running or cycling or kind of chow down? Come on, buddy. So this information is applicable whether you're somebody who's a plant-based vegetarian eater or you're somebody who's a carnivore. Um, you don't have to be plant-based, but there's some great plant-based nutrition, sports nutrition books out there. Vegetarian
Dietary Sports Nutrition, which I wrote the forward for. Highly recommend it if you want more detail. Um, Becoming Vegan, another great book uh, that has a sports nutrition section. We're starting to see more plant-based specific sports nutrition books out there. Um, but for many years, it just wasn't a lot on the sports nutrition side. Partly because you can use the other books as well. So there are a few specifics out there. And then I did put down a couple that are my favorites that aren't necessarily plant-based sports nutrition, but uh, they're good references. And uh, I'm a big fan of Michael Pollan's work, because uh, we've read on the horse dilemma and the defense of you. It really, those books, like Andrew Wallace's books, I'm saying it's not really common. Super short. 